use of photography. It's painting with light. I know that sounds very abstract, but what it means is this. The best way to tell the story with a photograph is with the right light. Is it click on the walking? Yeah, okay, so you're just doing your phone right? So telling a story with light is the best way because your photograph is supposed to be a thousand words approximately in just one photograph. You're telling a story. So you, I'm sure you've taken photos where when you take the photo of a place, it looks dull, drab, and you're wondering what's wrong. The basic problem is probably the lighting sucks. So that's the first thing you should understand. Perfect lighting makes anywhere look beautiful, even the most. I'm sure Instagram is a very good example. A lot of the places you see on Instagram are your regular streets, your regular houses, regular, but they take it at the right time with the right light, and then it makes it look wow. So when you go there, you travel abroad, and you're like, but I saw this on Instagram, it didn't look as wonderful. They took it with perfect lighting. That's the basic. Just understand the great lighting makes any project, any building, anywhere look fantastic. So, next slide. So, I talked before, what equipment do you need? Start with something they are familiar, which is everybody has a nice or a decent phone nowadays, and you can use that to start. Start with your phone, taking photos of places, things. It's like a good way to train your eye. Because I believe photography is, is more than just taking snapshots. What are you seeing with your photographs? Do your photographs make people stand and stare like, oh wow, is that, what, is that a building that I'm familiar with? Which is what I do a lot. I take photos of places and people are like, is it the same place that I see that looks really ugly? So your photos should have life. They should have merit. Why are you taking them? So starting with your phone and training your eye to see what other people don't see is the first step to great photography. Because a photograph tells a thousand words, a thousand stories. How well you take that photograph would determine how well people would like it or appreciate it. So, like I was saying, light is the most basic thing, especially in architecture. People, birthdays, events, babies, you can move them around. They are movable. You can say, oh, okay, you are not posing right. Maybe I'll move the lights or I'll move you. But the building or interior, you can't move the building. You can't move this, the furniture. It's like, if I want to take a photo of this place, I can't move you guys. I can't move the chair. I just have to make the best use of it. So learning how to shape light would help you a lot, especially in architecture, where you can't move the building or the subject as much. Go back to that side. Previous one. Yeah. So this is an example of what I'm saying. Taking a photo and then making it more than what it is. How do you do that? That's basically studying light, form, shape. I know that's like basic Aki principles of light, form, form follows function. But light is also a way of telling form or function. So the building on the left is Civic Center. Who here knows Civic Center? Like everybody, everybody knows who's of that. But in, I took that at midday when the sun was at the brightest, and then I removed the distractions. So people are like, they see that it's Civic Center, but they've never seen it in that light. That is architecture photography. It's not just taking a random picture without thought. You have to put thought into your images, or people will not stop and appreciate it. The second one is 1004. I like the buildings, but they are really ugly. Everybody admits that. 1004 is like, if you take photos there, everybody's like, Ugh, the place just looks somewhat decent. But I took that photo on a day when the sun would not show the terrible facade. So the only thing you can see is yellow and the stairs. You can't really see the front, which is littered with people's clothes and things and <laughs> hot stuff. That's what I'm saying. Light is a very good way of telling stories. It helps you hide things. It helps you emphasize things. So that's the best way to tell a story or to shape 
any photo is with light. Next one. Next one. Okay, so let's go into the technical of what is architecture. If you are, if you are taking photos of a building, you just, most people would take their phone, take their eye level, or slant it up and take a photo. That's terrible. <laughs> Let me just be honest. I used to do it a lot. Then I noticed that when I take photos like that, the building looks funny or it doesn't come out right. I had to learn by going through architecture. A good, a good way to train your eye is to go through um, interior magazines, online, digital, or hard copy. Interior magazines, architecture magazines. Architectural Digest is a good one. Act Daily. They, they give out, they send out daily newsletters. It's a very good one to train your eyes because the photos they send or the photos they use in these magazines, international, local, not local, international, the photos tell the story of the building. So the very perfect way to train your eyes is to read through and look at the way and styling they use to take those photos because the styling matters. If you're taking photos of a house, like a residential house, it's different from if you're taking photos of a school. Like, for example now, in this, which is composition, that's taking shots of a building. This is um, the new lecture hall at Lasso, built by PWDC, Ade Shokumbi. It's a concrete structure, it's massive. Like, it dwarfs a lot of buildings in the surroundings. How well would you if, you, if you stand here now and take a photo of it without thinking about it or without looking around and seeing what kind of light is available, it will turn out really ugly, which is what some other people tried to do and it didn't come out well. So this photo, the first one, the reason why I framed it that way is because the building is huge. How do you make a massive building look like it fits into your surroundings. You make it, you move really far back, like really, really, really far back to make it look like it fits in. Because if you stand too close to that, I can, you can see the entrance. If someone stands there and tries to take a photo, it will be too big and it look out of place. One. And two, you won't be able to get the entire building. So the best way to start is moving far back, as far back as safely possible, because if you move too far back, you're probably on the road. You have to watch that as well. And take it with other elements in your scene, like the grass and the tree. There was a tree overhead, so I used that to frame it. The second shot is of the building from the side. A very, very important tip I learned from another architecture photographer is when you're taking buildings, take from three angles. Straight on, which is the first one, from the side, which is the second one, and very, very close, which is the third one. So in any set of architectural photos you see, there are always these three types of images. That comprises the entire the entire set. So in framing it this way, it makes it come across as beautiful, as very relatable, and you can see and feel the building. Okay. So does anybody understand the points of framing and compositing your images? OK, so if you want to take a photo of this building, where would you start? Someone should answer me. If you want to take a photo of this Muson Center, where would you stand to get a nice shot? Does anybody have an answer? <laughs> no, it's, it's a simple question. Where would you stand? <laughs> Let's be practical. Because, yeah, where would you stand? Sorry? I can't hear you. <laughs> I didn't hear what you said. Where in front of the building? I'm, that's why I'm being specific. Where in front would you stand? No. 
That's wrong. If you, if you stand, you will get the gate. You won't get the building. If you stand in front, in front of the gate, yeah. You will, if you want to get a good shot, you will stand on the other side of the road where the path is. The trees are part of it. The trees are part of it. The person that designed this building actually planted those trees in the design or render. You know those 3D renders we all see. The trees were meant to frame it from because this entire area before used to have a lot of trees. Most people are now away. Before they started paving everywhere and putting concrete. So the trees were meant to frame it. So if you are taking photos of a building like this, you have to frame it with the trees because you can't tell it cut down the trees because they're taking photos. So that's what I mean by be aware of where you're standing to get the right framing and right shot. <laughs> okay, so for, that's for exteriors. For interiors, that's the tricky part. Because we are indoors, there's the only light available is probably the headlights like this. Or if you are fortunate, large enough windows, which is not always common. So how do you take nice photographs inside? Like as this example now, it's a residential bathroom, which most people would think of, oh, that's not something I'll take photographs of. But if you are doing it as a profession, you take photos of different types of buildings, different interiors. So you have to be able to use that same skill set of thinking, where do I stand to get the best shots? You have to apply it to every scenario. So in a scenario like this, an in interior space that is not larger than, I guess, this corner, where would you stand to get the right shots? I'm saying in an interior, if you are doing an interior shot, there's not a lot of space anyway. So framing is even more important and using the lights as you have it is more important. So standing right in front of your subject is the best way to start. And one little fact is this. If you are doing interiors, you need specialized lenses. You can't really use your phone because your phone is limited in how wide it can go. So they call them um, wide angle as, I think it's, um, aspherical lenses. Aspherical lenses are lenses that remove distortion. So I'm sure you've seen some photos of very, very, so wide that it distorts and curves everything around it. That isn't what they use for architecture. They use aspherical wide-angle lenses. That means the lens is so wide, but it doesn't distort your straight lines. That's a, that's a specialty lens for architecture. You don't see it everywhere, but it's something to note. If you are going to be taking it seriously, and you want to buy lenses and extra um, equipment. So the lens used in that shot is a 10 to 16 millimeter lens. It's pretty wide. Like if you stand, if you stand here, you can get everything here without stressing. That's how wide it is. But it's, the lens is pretty expensive though. Then for the next shot, you can use your regular lens, the regular lens used in portraiture or, or, or whatnot. Same lens for the detail shot. So the, what I mentioned before, which is you have a wide shot, you have a mid-range shot, which is a bit close, then you have really close. That applies to every scenario that you're taking photos of. So if you enter a space and you want to take photos, go through the space first, think about it, because architecture for gravity is, you are basically thinking out your process. You're not just taking random photos. Think out your process. How do I want to frame each space? How many shots do I need? And from there, you begin to understand how best to tell the story of the space, which is why you are taking photos of it. So, OK, so I've explained the first one, which is what does your photo convey? 
what I try, what detail are you trying to bring out? Then value of the shots, same thing. Think about your shots. You don't just go on and run and gone, which is just taking photos indiscriminately. Think about it. If you need a wide angle shot, where do I stand? If I need to take a detailed shot, where do I stand? What kind of shot am I taking? Then rule of thoughts. In photography, it's like a basic principle. When you open your camera lens on your phone, you have this set of grids. They call it the rule of thoughts. It's to help you balance your photos, as well as place important things in such a way that is pleasing to the viewer. It's a very basic principle. If you, if you, if you are aware of it, you see it practically every, almost every shot. There's always a grid, an imaginary grid over it. They place the most important items on that grid. And that's the most pleasing, what they've noticed in the arts to the, to the human eye. If you place your object off or off center on the grid, people would notice it and they'll be bothered by it, but they won't understand why they're bothered by it. So that rule of thought is a basic way of compositing your images. Putting the most important things on the grid is the best and easiest way to frame your shot. So it's pleasing to the eye and people would understand what you take photos of. Then visual balance also ties to rule of thoughts. Let your images be visually pleasing. Balancing, arranging your shots in such a way that people understand it. Um, a very good example of visual balance is this. If I'm taking this shot, the shot on the left, extreme left. If I'm taking this shot without the trees and without the leaves, it will look blank, look a bit bland, because you just see the building, you see grass, and you see white sky. So you will feel mm, something is missing, but you can't really tell. That's the point of balance. If you are taking photos of something on the ground and there's a lot of sky, what is in the sky? If it's just blank, it is better you position your building such that it fills most of the screen. If not, leaving such blank space is disorienting to whoever is seeing the photo. And they won't understand why they don't like it, they just wouldn't like it. It's like a uh, subliminal uh, effect. So that's for visual balance. Then focal point also ties into rule of thoughts. The most important thing in your shot that you are taking a photo of, along with all the environment, the most important thing should be on the grid, or should be touching the grid. So your eyes naturally move to it. The rule of thoughts were invented in the Renaissance and art period, like the golden ratio, and some other diagonal grids and all what. They were art-based rules, visual rules, to guide the viewer on where to put their eyes or where to, where to look on a photograph. So if you have visual cues of where to look, the better arranged your photograph, the more pleasing the photograph. The more people like it, the more people appreciate it. So it's like an uh, unwritten rule, sort of. So the most beautiful images all follow either the golden ratio, the rule of thoughts, or the diagonal ratio. I love this. It's like, can do a further read on, on framing and composition in photos and art. Because photography is a branch of art. So, software. Who, is, who here is familiar with Photoshop? What do you use Photoshop for? Let me just ask a basic question. <laughs> what do you use it for? Sorry? Editing photos. You know, the Adobe suite has more than Photoshop. Who is aware of that? OK, not many people are aware that. Actually, Adobe has about 23 products. Not just Photoshop, 23 products. And photography is about half of them. The other half is videography, sound, and graphics. So the Adobe um, lineup of um, products, I use basically four of them. 
the four up on the screen. So when I take a photograph, I take it out of my camera, I put it in my laptop, and then I use these four on every single image that I bring out. So Adobe Bridge, which is their um, file organizing and management system, very important because if you are going for a shoot, I, when I go for a shoot, I average 400, 500 pictures. If you are doing that and you have multiple shoots, how do you manage your files? Because it's, it's the law of files. By the time you've done like five, six shoots, I have 5,000, 6,000 photographs. The best way to give yourself less headache and less heartache is to have a very good file management. And I use Adobe Bridge for that. They have a very simple, not the file explorer everybody has in their system, that Windows has. That is terrible. It's a terrible way to manage your photographs. Adobe Bridge is much better. It can classify by time, by ISO, which is a camera, by orientation, by date, by second, by lighting. It is so very vast. So it's very easy to to whittle down or get the photos you want out of a batch of maybe 5,000 without stressing. Just a few clicks and you get it. But if you're using File Explorer, can you imagine scrolling down, scrolling down 5,000 photographs? That's a very bad idea. Then Camera Raw is an add-on to Bridge. It's like a Photoshop version, but for Adobe Bridge. So Camera Raw is what I use to do batch processing. So if you have 5,000, or if you have 500 photographs and you want to maybe apply, out of the 500, maybe 300, you want to apply a particular preset or a particular look, maybe adjusting the bite balance or temperature or whatever, or something in the photograph. The best way to do it is to do it as a batch. And Adobe Raw in Bridge is the best way to do it. So with a few clicks, you've adjusted five, 300 photographs without stress. So that's why I use it. Then Lightroom, because most people here are either aware, some people use Lightroom, some people use Photoshop. They are close, but they don't do the same thing. I'm sure people are not aware. Lightroom and Photoshop are close, but they don't do the same thing. Lightroom is closer to Adobe Raw than Photoshop. That's the funny thing. It's like somewhere in the middle, it has its usefulness, but it cannot replace Photoshop. So after the bridge, sorting out, uh, compositing in Adobe Raw, doing the basic edits, I take it to Lightroom, because Lightroom has an edge over bridge and Photoshop, which is color editing, which is very, very important. In architecture photography, you have um, different light and color profiles. I think the easiest way to explain it is, okay, in this room now, we are using white light, bluish white light. You don't notice that it's blue because you are using your natural, your natural eye compensates and changes it to white, but it's actually bluish. When you go outside, you notice that outside looks a bit warm. The sunlight is warm light. This light is cold light. So in a situation where you're editing and you want to change the lighting from cold to warm, Lightroom is best at doing that. Or maybe um, the lighting in a room, like okay, if, you have, if you take photos in an event, you see the lights are colored, like purple, red. If you want to change those lights to any other color, the best way to do it is in Lightroom. It will identify the color in the space and change it to whatever you like. That's how photographers get that um, unrealistic look on Instagram, where you see everything is super colored or purple and yellow, green, those very hyper colored images on Instagram. They do it in Lightroom because you can take a normal image like this, change the red chairs to yellow, change the wall to green. You can do anything like that in Lightroom. Lightroom is very good at that. But it doesn't replace Photoshop because Photoshop is best for image manipulation. And I'm sure people are aware of that. When you're adding, adding things or removing things from mini images, Photoshop is very good for that. Or creating HDR images. 
So in Photoshop, an example would be, um, let's say we take a photo of this wall, this marble wall, and there are some tiles that are funny colored. The easiest way to take them out is in Photoshop with a, um, there's a new addition to Photoshop, I think it was CC 2017, where you can circle out an object in a shot and Photoshop will remove it without leaving any marks. So you can basically erase things from photos with Photoshop. And the AI would calibrate as if the thing or human or object was never there. So you can erase people from photographs, basically. That's how, that's how good the AI is right now in Photoshop. You can, that's why if, you, if you're scrolling through Instagram, you see photos of places where there are no people. That's not possible. You can't go during the day and take photo of maybe the Eiffel Tower and then there's nobody in sight. They use Photoshop to erase all the people. So they give it that, oh, I was there first. No, that's a lie. <laughs> use Photoshop to remove people. <laughs> or maybe images where they take photo of uh, a building and they, you see birds or you see plane or you see a moon in the sky, that's Photoshop. Those things don't, are not actually dead, they just added it. So you can add things and remove things with ease in Photoshop. That's why they are Lightroom and Photoshop are close, but you can also do image and light modification in Photoshop, but it doesn't, doesn't have anything on Lightroom. So those are the four softwares I use on every image that I take. So you have Bridge, which is to manage file sort, Sort out the ones I want to use, sort out the ones that are not necessary. Then you have RAW to do batch processing. Then Lightroom for color profile and color editing. Then Photoshop to tweak and remove blemishes or things that you don't want in the image. Which is more work than most people think it is. Because most people think architecture photography is just, you take a shot and then you just process it and then it comes out. You have to do a lot of tweaking on it. Let me give a good example. This image, the one in the middle, it looks, the, the ground looks like it has a striped theme, right? There was a lot of dirt on the ground, actually. And there were people in front of the building when I was taking the shot. So I removed the people and cleaned up the area as well as removing some other blemishes on the building in Photoshop. So Photoshop is very good for cleaning out your images and making them look spotless. Most of the images you see of buildings, places, interiors are not that spotless in real life. There are lots of blemishes like in, on incorrect tiling, you have things that come out of the ceiling, all sorts of things, wires everywhere. You don't want that showing up in your shot. If you want the perfect shot, you have to remove all those little things, like wires, like all these vents. If you're taking a photo of this space, you're going to have to remove all these vents and clean up the walls and clean up the tiles. So all that is done in Photoshop, which is why most people don't understand why photograph arch architecture in particular is so stressful. They say, oh, it's not just to take a photo, but you have to do a lot of cleanup. Yeah, just to snap and then, but you have to do a lot of cleanup, more cleanup than most people are aware. Because as you stepped into this room, I'm sure you didn't notice that there were, most, there were funny colored tiles on the wall, the very, very ugly and very dirty ceiling, and some other funny things that you know. But if you take a photo, you will notice it. And then people are like, I don't like the photo, but they don't know why they don't like it. The reason why is there are so many things that you need to remove so that it doesn't distract from what you are taking photos of. Okay. Um, okay, so now post-processing. You've taken your photo, you've arranged it, you've done edits, what's next? Do's and don'ts. Post-processing is easy, it's very easy to go overboard. Those those two images, they are the same, but one has been overprocessed. 
and one is natural to what it looks like. I'm sure the projector has butchered the shots, but bear with it. It has overexposed the shots, but overprocessing is very, very rampant, which is where you spoil the photos by using too much Photoshop or Lightroom or so and so. So very simple guidelines when you're using Photoshop on any image. Eliminate distractions, which is tidying up, removing very ugly things and all whatnot. Then minor color tweaking, maybe the light was looking too blue or too green and you want to change it, that's fine. But where you would stop if you are doing processing in Photoshop is when you start to change the colors in your shot. Like for example, if you take a photo of this space, the chairs are red, the curtains are red, and the ground is a clay brown. You would not change chairs to dark green. You have lost the point of taking the photo. Anyway, if you now change it to dark green, you're no longer doing architecture photography, you're now doing uh, more of con conceptual photography where you are distorting the colors to your own realism or an artistic expression. But retaining the colors as they were when you took them is part of post-processing. So when you process your image to the point where you can't recognize it anymore, then it's time to just dial back all, all the over overcooking and over processing. Then sharpening. Don't over sharpen your photos. Sharpening brings out artifacts, something you can't see, but when you see them on your screen, you can't see it on your phone, when you print it out or you see it on the laptop screen, you will notice that the photo is too sharp or things just seem to come out of places in the shot. That means the photo has been over sharpened to the point where you can see the individual lines in the tiling. That's bad. It's too sharp. You, you, will not, you will not see the photo anymore. All you just see is something is wrong with the photo. So that's another thing to avoid in your post-processing. Changing colors from the original intent, one, and over-sharpening. Over-sharpening is very, very bad. It spoils the image and detracts your eyes from the entire point of taking the photo anyway. Um, what else? Okay. So I wanted to touch on color again. Because color is very, very important. Color profiles have different uses, especially if you are taking photos, you need to understand color. Like I said, the light here, the white light we're using now is bluish. If you go outside, you will notice that the lights and the walls are warmer. That light is important because when you are taking photos of places and spaces, the light will change the material color. A very good example is, I went for a shoot, it was an interior. So the bedroom was all beige. The leather was beige, the bed was beige, the wall was beige, the cotton, the floor, everything was beige. The theme was beige and black. So you have black highlights. So in a situation where the room is beige and the color is warm, how do you know what shade is the floor? That's a very funny question, but it happens a lot. If you are not careful, if you use the wrong color profile, the beige will turn out to be white. And then at some point, your client will be asking you, but the, but the bed is beige, like sand color beige. Why is it looking white? And you'll be able to answer because once you've taken it in the wrong color profile, it's very hard to undo because it has stamped it as white and except you do a lot of processing, which is, we take forever, it won't go back to beige. You have to reshoot. So thankfully, that day, I actually noticed before I started shooting that the lights were warm in the room and everything was beige. So I had to use flash, external flash, and change my color profile so that everything turns out beige, not white. Because when everything in the room is beige, it's a funny thing. When everything in the room is beige or one color, 
it's difficult, so you have to be very careful with that, especially with the lighting, because it can change it. And your client will be like, but this thing is supposed to be this color. Why is, does it look funny? <laughs> you won't be able to answer, and you will know where you got it wrong. Then multiple, shooting in multiple light situations. Okay, that's a very, very important one as well. If you get to a shoot, be it exterior or interior, be aware of the lighting situation. So in a case where, like this, like this shot on the left, it was shot at noonday, which is very, very, very bright. In that kind of situation, a lot of the details will be washed out. You'll be able to make out details, especially the fact that they use tyrolene on the wall. Because it's so bright, everything would wash out. So you have to now be aware, OK, what do I need to do so that when I take photos, it doesn't wash out? Because if you, if you get to a shoot and you're not aware of the lighting situation and things around you, you would take your shot, go home, and realize that, oh, this thing is washed out. But you've taken it, and you can't go back. Not every situation where you be able to go back and reshoot. And that will be lost time, lost money, and your clients will be mad at you. So take the few extra minutes to just chill, okay, understand the light, understand the scenario, and know the best. Because just getting in and shooting, you just realize when you get home that half the photos are useless because they've been washed out because it, it seems, either the scene was too bright or the scene was too dark, which is totally spoiled the entire thing. Then post-production as well. This image on the right was a composite. Because kitchens are very difficult to photograph, you have to do a lot of processing in Photoshop to get it to look as natural, which is the point of post-production, as natural as possible. It's a composite because you have to take the lights. The light, there were two types of lights in the kitchen, warm light and white light. So I take two separate sets of images just to make it look natural and let the wood, because the contractor was the one who did the wood finishing and supplied the cabinetry. He didn't want his wood to look red or look dark brown because he's trying to sell it to other clients. Oh, this is what this wood actually looks like. So compositing in Photoshop is a very good way to make sure that the things you see are realized in as real as you saw them yourself.